Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beersmith episode number 34. This week's sponsor is Beersmith, beersmith.com. You can find our blog at beersmith.com slash blog, where we have all 34 episodes of this podcast, including videos of the last seven or so. And we have over 150 articles that I've written about homebrewing. And now, without further ado, let's jump right into this week's episode. Today on the show, I have Justin Crossley from the Brewing Network. It's one of the largest internet radio shows and podcasts uh, on the internet, and you can find him at thebrewingnetwork.com. Justin, it's, uh, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Brad. It's fun to be here. Now, you run the Brewing Network, which is one of the most uh, popular early uh, podcasts about beer, beer brewing and home brewing. How'd you get started in that? Yeah, uh, we got started really early. Uh, you know, I was, I've been a beer fan for, I, I guess, my whole life, uh, and a craft beer fan, certainly for the last, uh, you know, 15 years or so. And then I went to school for, for broadcasting, and when I graduated, um, you know, a, a, a girlfriend of mine, she used to be on the show, actually, Daniela, uh, she bought me a homebrew kit. And I got into homebrewing, and I was kind of, yeah, I'd just gotten out of college, and I was bartending. I wasn't doing much with broadcasting. And everybody, uh, you know, a lot of my professors at school said, you know, you really ought to pay attention to what's happening on the Internet right now and, and not just be interested in, in traditional terrestrial radio. And I really took that to heart, and I just thought, you know, there's so many uh, homebrewers around me and craft breweries around me. I really think I could, I could put the two things together and, uh, you know, my love for broadcasting and radio and my love for beer and let other people, you know, sit in on the conversation. And basically, I just, you know, I had so many stupid questions about brewing, and I thought, you know, I, I can't possibly be the only one with all of these stupid questions. And so I figured if, if other people could tune in and listen to me asking all the dumb questions, or even better yet, you know, if they could send in questions too, and I bring these people into the show, uh, then everybody would benefit. And so it started out with just a real simple idea that I figured look, if I was doing it, uh, other people needed to hear this stuff too. And, um, you know, it, it worked out fantastic. I was right that people wanted to listen. And there was kind of a, you know, there was a void of that type of access and information. I mean, of course, there's, you know, amazing books out there and there, there have been for years, but nothing where you actually got to, you know, interview the brewer yourself, ask these guys yourself. And I think that's just what we provided access to. So I put the two together and it worked. Now, your first show was called The Session and your first show actually was published on June 5th, uh, 2005. Yeah. Now, ironically, the same month, uh, iTunes started carrying podcasts for the very first time. So your, your timing was pretty darn good there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that really gave a lot of energy to the, to the podcast, took it out of the hands of hobbyists and really put it in the, in the hands of the masses. So what was it like in those early days of podcasting? I mean, you were really one of the first podcasters. Yeah, you know, there were certainly other podcasters in, you know, in other genres, but, you know, in, on the beer side, I, you know, if not the first, I think literally, you know, there were some other ones that started within a week or two after us, um, which is neither here nor there, but, you know... I think I'd like to say it was an accident that, that the podcast started just after we did. But really, that was me listening to the professors at school, you know, at my broadcasting university. And they, you know, a lot of the students in there weren't paying attention. You know, they wanted to be on the radio. They wanted to be the next Howard Stern. And these professors kept saying the same thing over and over. They said, you guys really ought to pay attention to what's happening on the Internet. And so I did. And I found out that there was these podcasts out there and that iTunes was going to back it, that they were really going to push it. And so, uh, you know, it came out, uh, it gave access, uh, you know, and a kind of a delivery platform, I think was the most important thing so that people could download the show easily. And it, it certainly was a bit of luck with being in the right place at the right time. Um, and, and also just credit to some of my university professors who, who told me to pay attention to that stuff. So I will say this though, you know, you kind of mentioned the, the access uh, that it gave, uh, hobbyists and things like that. And, and I've always said that the best thing about podcasts is that anybody could do them. But I also say that the best, that the, that the worst thing about podcasts is that anybody could do them. And I think if you kind of listen to a lot of the material that's out there, um, it doesn't sound like what you're used to. It doesn't sound like the radio or it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem like TV. And, you know, we don't all know how to, to broadcast, but we all know what good broadcasting is because we've grown up with it. Every one of us has listened to the radio and watched TV and all of that. So, so podcasts certainly democratize the ability to do it, but sometimes that's not a good thing. You know? 
<laughs> well, your mainline show, the session, is a is a four hour long uh, live format that's done. Um, let's see, it's every it's a three Sundays a month, and it's on yeah. at five p.m. Uh, Pacific time. It's actually done live. Uh, right. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about the session. Sure. Yeah, you know, the the original idea for the session was that it would be a morning radio format that would, uh, instead of focusing on famous people like morning radio did, we our interviews would be focused on brewers. And in the very beginning, it was also focused, you know, really on education that we wanted to, I, I could back then pick apart every single part of the brewing process because I didn't know much about it and, and there was so much to it. So we spent the first couple years doing just that, you know, me and and a uh, and co-host but but me being really the only amateur in the room uh picking apart every basic part every advanced part every part of brewing um you know to show people uh, what it's like and to help them you know learn along with me um and then the secondary idea was that i i have a short attention span and i get bored really easy and <laughs> You know, I think I'm an entertainer more than anything. I'm not so much of a, of a brewer or a broadcaster, but I like to entertain. And if the show just spent, you know, an hour focusing just on the technical side of brewing, I just would have quit a long time ago. It would have been too boring for me. So I, I had to infuse it with fun and, and jokes and kind of the same thing you would do on a brew day anyway. The same thing I was doing with, with friends over the house or anything like that. And that's how it turned into a, a three hour show, you know, <laughs> which every podcast rule in the book says you're not supposed to do shows. Most of them say not more than 30 minutes. Uh, that's stretched a little bit to an hour now, but you won't really find anybody else doing three hour shows. Uh, yeah. But hey, if you're only doing it once a week, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners commute all week. So it gives them, you know, it gives them three or four days worth of, uh, you know, commuting entertainment out of one show. So Fantastic. Well, a key feature of the show is uh, is really your colorful co-hosts, and and uh, yeah, I got a, just a few of them. Doc, Tasty, uh, there's a whole bunch more. Uh, yeah. Can you say a little bit about the cast and and sort of how that came together and how they play in the show? Yeah, absolutely. I knew also that I could not pull this show off just me. For one, I I didn't know enough about brewing, but I just thought you know the show needs an amateur and the show needs an intermediate brewer. In the beginning, that was John Plisse, and the show needs an expert. I was um. I used to be a big fan of uh, Adam Carolla as a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And he did the show, you know, all throughout me growing up, they did the show called Love Lines. And it was Adam Carolla acting like a jackass and being funny and Dr. Drew. And Dr. Drew could answer everything about everything. And I knew that, that we needed that on the show. If we're going to do this beer show, people have to be able to call in and get their questions answered. And so that's where Doc came in. I met Doc at John Plisse's homebrew club meeting, which was Doe's. And I talked to him a little while, and, and he just really was into the science side of brewing. And so I invited him on the show for the first time, and he was perfect. And he loved it, and I loved having him on. I had no idea at the time that he was also a jackass like me and could really kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, have a good time. Uh, but he, he's, he's kind of both. You know, he could just answer all the questions and have fun doing it. And the show has really uh, evolved with different cast members. JP came on later on. And JP's kind of a color guy for me. He's like my right-hand man. And, and he knows a lot about brewing, too. You know, he worked at More Beer for years. I don't know, 10 years or something. And um, he, so he could answer a lot of the intermediate brewing questions. And then he's just funny. I just needed a, a guy to just be funny. Um, Tasty came on later on. We had to beg Tasty to do the show. You know, I knew him for a couple of years before he would ever come on. And Doc was telling him, you got to come do it. And, you know, he was kind of our local... Uh, homebrew wizard in the sense that everything that he made was tasty. Everything, that's how he got his name. Just everything he made was good. So we finally got him to come on the show and he did like it. And the listeners love him. And he's kind of everybody's friend. You know, that's, that's his role. He can answer all the, um, he's certainly a technical brewer, but he's more of an everyday brewer too. He can really just tell you how it's done in layman's terms and he makes great beer out of it. So that's where he comes in and Gosh, Nate Smith has come on board lately. Nathan Smith was a guy we interviewed. Yeah, uh, Nate's, Nate's been on my show a couple times. He's great. He is great. And we had him on to do topics originally. He was a guest. And uh, he was so good at picking apart a single topic and presenting it that uh, I said, you know, listen, anytime you want to do the show, just come co-host because you can answer these questions and you can ask great questions, which he does of our guests quite often. Um. 
you know, Bevo is our chat moderator. Mm-hmm. So, uh, she, you know, listeners really love her too. And look, if it's a room full of testosterone, you also kind of need a, a female presence, I think, to help make it entertaining <laughs> and just to change it up. I mean, who wants to be in a room full of dudes for that long? Um, so Bevo is a lot of fun and then helps us, you know, field live calls and, uh, you know, people live in the chat. So a lot of people uh, who kind of help out on the show. Chad used to be our producer. We have a new producer now, Moscow, and, and he's, done, he's really been great with booking guests. So it's, uh, it is certainly not a one-man show. Uh, you know, we, I couldn't do any of this without that team. So. Well, I think another key feature of the show is your live format. You can bring in, uh, you know, you bring in chat, cell phones, uh, guests, more. How does a live audience really factor into your show? Yeah, that was another thing that came from my love of, of radio in general. You know, um, I, uh, you could do a regular podcast where you record it, but to me, that's not the beauty of radio and, and why I used to love morning radio so much. It's an interactive thing. You know, radio has always been something that's much more touchable uh, to, to, I think, the, most of the public than television is. You know, television, everybody's a star and they're up on TV and you don't get to interact with them. But radio, you know, your local radio guy, you did get to interact with them. So, it also was kind of part of the show that, you know, I wanted other people to have access to our guests. I wanted, I had my dumb questions about brewing and the things I was making mistakes about, but I knew there was a lot more questions out there, you know, more advanced questions, more intelligent questions sometimes. And so by doing it live, it gave us that real radio feel where the listeners themselves become characters on the show. They're part of it. Um, for our podcast listeners, you know, they, they listen to all these people who call in week in and week out and they get to know them too. And then of course, like I said, just being able to ask the questions. So the live chat room, if you don't want to call in, you type in your questions there and Bevo's moderating that most of the time and sends them right over to me. So right during the interview, you know, one of our great guests, I'll just pass the question along and, and then the same with the telephone. So I, again, I just, I, I, it's a new medium. The podcast it was new then. But I wanted it to feel like an old medium. I wanted it to feel like real radio. So I kind of refuse to do them if they're not live. I don't like it at all unless it's live. Well, you've had some great guests over the years as well. Uh, can you can tell us who a few of your favorites were over the years? Oh, <laughs> we have. I, I've been lucky to sit in this room with uh, some uh, amazing guests. And that's due to, you know, Chad and John Plisse in the beginning used to book it and now Moscow. Um Dan Gordon from Gordon Beerish, he's always been a favorite of ours. Um, I was intimidated by him when he first came in because he was, you know, Gordon Beerish, the big brewery. And uh, you know what? He was just so cool and down to earth and fun. And he was happy to talk about the technical side of brewing and, you know, you know real German lager brewing. But he also wanted to mess around and joke. He, he refuses to come on the show unless we play Beer Jeopardy. It's his favorite thing that, he, that we do here. <laughs> You absolutely won't show up unless I plan a game of Beer Jeopardy. Um, last year, I finally got to, I've always wanted to, and I finally got to sit with the guys from Anchor Steam. Um, so Mark Carpenter, who's been with Anchor Steam for uh, like 30 years now. Uh, Mike Lee and Bruce Joseph, his assistant brewers there. And uh, that was just a lot of fun. That's one of those shows where you kind of just throw out a softball and, and then you just shut up. And you listen to those guys because they've got so much, you know, so many stories and amazing things to say that half the time I just, I didn't want to say a word. I just wanted them to keep talking, you know, um, got to interview my favorite brewery, Cantillon, John Van Roy from Cantillon came on the show last year. Mm -hmm. Um, another great guy. I mean, he's in a, um, you know, we, we have some fans of the show, but when it comes to like Cantillon, I am a fanboy. You know, I, I, I'll stand in the corner staring at him. I want his autograph, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, you know, we've had a lot, the whites from white labs are always fun. I've become good friends with them through the show, mostly because we had so much fun on the show. I mean, here, Chris white, here's a, a total brainiac, you know, uh, a chemist, um, author, still yeah. author, still a professor sometimes down at, um, San Diego, I guess, uh, university of San Diego. Um, but comes in here and just has a great time. You know, we can make all the same, uh, jokes that we normally make. So a lot of good people. It's, it's been fun, and, and I'm honored most of the time to be able to sit next to those guys. Well, you've been doing this for almost seven years now, and you recently added a lot more shows. In fact, uh, some of them came just a few months after you launched the first one. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the other shows, like Bruce Strong, The Jamil Show, and, and some of the others that have come about? Sure. 
Yeah, well, the first thing was that I knew that not everybody would be into the Sunday session format. You know, uh, a lot of that format was for me. It was <laughs> so that I would be entertained. <laughs> and I knew that that wasn't going to be for everybody. So from the beginning, and, and it's why we called it the Brewing Network, you know, we knew that there'd be multiple shows so that we could try to, you know, fit more of, of the needs of, of homebrewers. And the first show that became apparent to do was after we had Jamil Zanishev come on the, the Sunday session and interview him. And he was such an expert on, on well, everything. Uh, his beer was amazing. Um, but really, beer styles and competition brewing at that time was, was kind of his niche. And um, he was so good at it that him and John Plisse kind of got together and they thought, hey, what if we cover every single beer style in the BJCP? And, and it could be a sort of a study guide for people. And that's just what they did. So they spent over two years um, doing one-hour shows covering each and every BJCP style. And when it came to an end, um, you know, I didn't want Jamil to go away. So we kind of created another show around him. And that's now called uh, Can You Brew It? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was intended that um, they would interview uh, brewers. But listeners would actually send in requests. That, this is my favorite commercial beer and I want to know how to brew it. They would go interview the brewers. And then knowing that the recipe doesn't always translate A to B, you know, it doesn't go straight from their big system to our small system. They would then tweak the recipe a little bit, give it a shot, and the show would be based around that, that first shot. You know, they only got the one shot. They come on the show, we judge the beer. Did they clone it or not? That's it. There's no in-between. It's either a clone or it's not a clone. And if it's a clone, we give out the recipe. Uh, if it's not, we have to redo the show. <laughs> so there's a, a few of those. Um, Let's see, Bruce Strong came about because I met John Palmer uh, again through the show, and I think I met him first time at the National Homebrewers Conference. Yeah, John was on, just on last week, actually. Uh, on your show? Yeah, on the last episode, yeah. Isn't he great? He's been I on mean, many times. He's wonderful. He's just such a nice guy and down to earth and just love, I mean, you can tell by how comprehensive his book, How to Brew, is that he just loves giving out that information. Um, and he knows so much about it. So... Uh, Jamil was really liking the radio thing and looking to do another show. And he had started to hang out with John Palmer a little more. And Jamil actually, I think is the one who came in and said, Hey, you know, we really ought to get John to do a show. And, um, and it would be more of a everything show. You know, they could cover every little part of brewing and they could also do one of the most popular things they do now is just basic, uh, Q and a shows where you can write into their email, which I think is just uh brew strong at the brewing network.com. Yeah, I know. So they've done a lot of those lately. Yeah. Well, for one, I mean, if you think about it, the show's been on for, man, uh, it might be going on four years now, at least three years. Quite a long time, yeah. You do end up running out of topics. You know, they do that show twice a month, and you can go back and revisit topics, but when you start to look at the Brewing Network and its longevity and how long are these guys going to be able to do it, you, you got to do something to create more topics in brewing. Uh, you know, even if you look at the beer magazines, um, they'll kind of put out the same issues after a few years. And that's okay. They get new authors covering it. They get new experts. So I don't mean that you get the same old information, but it does become difficult to come up with new material. What's not difficult is a, there is no shortage of questions from homebrewers about everything. So the Q&A shows allow them to come in and just answer what people want to hear, not what they thought would be a good topic, you know. Um, and it gives the show some longevity, too. Um, oh, and then we've also got now, we just added a couple years ago, uh, the homebrewed chef with Sean Paxton. Yeah. Sean's been on as well. He's wonderful. He is. And just full of information. And his, uh, idea was that no one else is doing a show just about food and beer. And so we brought him in to do that too. And it just gave us another, you know, a a asset really to the network. And I'll tell I hope we grow more. I hope there's a lot more shows that come out. You know, it just, uh, you, it's tough to find hosts sometimes, um, I think a lot, there are a lot of people out there that know a lot about beer, but, but presenting it is a different matter, and it's, it's not as easy to find people like that. Well, recently you launched your uh, television career with a, with a show for a local television network. Can you tell us, yeah. a, tell us a little about your move into TV? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't like TV as much, I'll tell you that. Really? Uh, yeah, the camera's, <laughs> the camera's a weird thing, you know. Uh, something about a microphone and my, you know, sitting in my studio, I can, God, I probably say things I shouldn't say about myself. I can talk about anything. I'm, I'm a wide open, but talking into that camera is a whole different thing. You have to treat it like it's a person and it's not a person. It's a piece of glass staring back at you. So it was weird. 
But it was fun. Basically, a, um, a production company approached me. I had met him a, a few years back, and he said, hey, I've got a sponsor who wants us to build a reality TV show based around homebrewers. And, um, you know, the idea was that it would be a little bit like Survivor. You, we'd have these teams of homebrewers that would compete against each other each week. Uh, they would be eliminated until we had a winner. And it was fun. It was a lot more work than I ever anticipated. TV is a pain. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It was a good learning experience. The show was a hit locally. Um, we did real well in the ratings. You can see my cat running around back there. I do see your cat yeah, in the video here. <laughs> We've recently adopted the- this stupid cat. It's driving me nuts, this thing. <laughs> um, so the... It was a lot of fun. It was a learning experience. And it led into some other TV stuff for me. They gave me a host of another show that it's not even beer related. So, but we were the first, uh, you know, uh, we created the first show of its kind. I'm really proud of that. You know, there was not another home brewing show out there before. Uh, it's called BYOB TV, Brew Your Own Beer TV. And um, you can still find it. I think episodes are still up on coffeetv20.com. Um, and it remains to see, be seen if there'll be another season. To be honest, it was such a, an amount of work with our with the budget that we were given, which was really small. Um, then I'm not jumping up and down to do it again, <laughs> unless they <laughs> unless they find a bigger budget to get us some help in there. Because uh, you know there were mistakes made, and I, I wish it was it, it was a good show overall for what we were given. It, it was a good show, and it was fun to give it a shot. Well, I think one of your great triumphs has been building the uh, what's called the BN Army, uh, mm-hmm. your your large base of loyal loyal followers. Can you talk for a minute about the BN Army and sort of how that came together? Sure. Yeah. The BN Army created themselves, for one. I think <laughs> that's the most important part about the BN Army is I didn't, I didn't come up with the term. I didn't come up with the group. Uh, I didn't even come up with the logo. Um, there was some hubbub years ago, um, kind of a, a feud between our podcasts and some of the other podcasts. And uh, it was around some silly things. Uh, but basically, uh, what it came down to was, um, they were saying, uh, some kind of not true and, and relatively angry things about the brewing network and our listeners were listening to their shows too. They, they listened to us and listened to them and they didn't like it. And the phrase started coming up on our forum, just sort of organically, you know, don't mess with the BN army. And, uh, and I, I wasn't happy about the feud, but, um, I did like the sound of our listeners coming together and calling themselves something because there were so many of them at the time and they were friends on the forum and friends in the chat room and the BN Army term kind of gave them a a group, you know, and a name. And another listener who was a graphic designer sent me these logos, uh, this whole list of logos. And he said, hey, I think this BN Army thing's got some legs. And so I made some logos for you. You can have them if you want. And there's like 10 logos and I'm kind of scrolling down and they're all awful. They're, they're terrible logos. <laughs> Until I get to the last one. And the last one is this hop grenade. And it's the, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's amazing. And he donated it to me. He said, well, it's yours. I love the show and, and take it. And so all of a sudden the BN Army was born. And, you know, you don't even have to do anything to be in the BN Army. You don't have to donate to the show. If you listen to the show... You're, you're in the BN Army, and that's it, and, and they completely own it. It's all listeners, you know. We just, we just help them along and give them what they want, you know. Now, I was at the American Homebrewing Conference last uh, June when the BN Army effectively won Homebrew Club of the Year. Yeah, big night. That was, uh, that was a great moment for you. How did, how did this very unconventional club, which, uh, you know, doesn't really have a location or, or even any right. formal organization uh, become become the top homebrewing club in, in 2011. You know, completely by accident. And I know not everyone's going to believe that, and that's okay. I, I was asked for years, uh, well, a couple of years, I guess, uh, from the listeners, please register the BN as a club. Register it as a club because uh, we don't have a local club, and you're my club. So you're always telling us to enter competitions. We spent a lot of years just telling people, you know, with Jamil included, if you want good feedback on your beer, you need to compete. Not to win, but to you'll get real judges tasting your beer that aren't your neighbor who just wants free beer, you know? And so we did all this, and so they started writing in and saying, look, if, if we want to enter, we want to enter under the, a club. Everyone else has a club. Uh, so I finally did it. I just, I registered the Brewing Network, and I said, there you go. Now you're allowed to write on the piece of paper, you know, the Brewing Network. And it really just, just took off. And so, uh, 
we've really become the club. Uh, there's two things that, that it, the way it's described to me uh, from our from its members. There's two groups of people. There are the groups of people who have no club near them, nowhere near, um, and we're their club. They listen every week, and those are their club meetings, and they learn from us. Um, and they couldn't have a local club if they wanted, unless they you know put it together. But some of these guys are just in the middle of nowhere. So there's that group. The other group is people who do have a local club, but they consider the BN the place that they get all of their beer education and even a lot of their camaraderie among the rest of the Brewing Network members. So they've got a local club and the Brewing Network club. Some of them enter under the Brewing Network. Some of them enter under the local club. Um, we didn't encourage anybody to, uh, to go, hey, guys, let's go out there and enter every region and do well and win club of the year. Now, I did always say, of course, hey, so many of you guys are entering under the Brewing Network. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if we were Club of the Year? Wouldn't that be great? And sure enough, it just happened. And I had no idea. I, know we, I knew we were doing good in the points, you know, going up to it. But I heard so many uh, from the other clubs and does included, you know, the medals, the medals, the medals. So I'm, I'm terrible at math. I hadn't really done the math. When they called our name at that, at that banquet. At the banquet, we, yeah. Oh, man. I'm telling you, I w it was a proud moment for me. I was so happy because, you know, we started it for these guys. I started the BN to teach these guys how to brew while I was asking questions and them. And to me, it was validation that, that the idea worked. All of these guys across the country learned to brew from, from the show. And here was the proof. You know, they won in, in so many categories, got the points, did it on their own. And uh, I, I, I just couldn't be happier for them. It was very cool. Well, you, you've said it a couple of times. You like to pretend that you actually don't know anything about brewing, but uh, you've been doing this for, for almost seven years now. <laughs> so I was wondering yeah. if you could share a few home brewing tips uh, maybe with the audience. You must have learned uh -oh. something after all those podcasts, right? I have. I always answer, you know, I do know about brewing. I could, I could tell somebody how to brew. But to do it yourself, you know, you got to practice a lot. You, you know, you really got, I'll be honest with you, Brad. I still have, I still have a hard time with your software. Not because it's difficult, but because I use it once every three months. And every time you go back in with anything, you got to remind yourself of how to use it. And it's the same with my brew system. I got to remind myself how to use it. So I could tell people how to brew. Sure, I've sat and listened, and, and I'm not that dumb. Uh, I, but brewing myself, it's an elusive animal, man. It's like golf for me. I, I love it, but I'm <laughs> real bad at it. Um, let's see. A couple of tips. Um, one of them is... Don't worry so much about the measurement of, you know, your volume of water, exactly how much it was and exactly what temperature it was down to the down to one degree and exactly what your knockout volume was and exactly this and exactly that. It's more important that you're consistent. In other words, use the same bucket to fill your mash tun with water every time. And if you fill that bucket three times, always fill it three times and then your measurement is correct. Uh, and the same goes with temperature. You know, I used to just worry, worry, worry. Oh, I'm supposed to be at 152, but I'm at 149. I ruined everything. And uh, it doesn't matter. Just get close. And the more consistent you become and the more you practice at those things, um, then later on you'll be able to dial in everything perfectly. You'll get your 152. You'll get the exact volume. You'll nail the exact gravity. Uh, but you got to just do it a bunch of times by being consistent. The other thing I would say is we've talked about it a lot over the last year and a half or so on the BN is late hop additions. All right. Um, you know, you got your bittering hop, which I've come to believe hardly even matters what it is. Just pick some neutral hop like Magnum. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, throw that in as your bitter, you know, your 60 minute. Um, you could even make it 90 minutes if you wanted to. I tend to boil for 90 minutes and then I throw the, the bittering hop in at 60. And then forget about that 30-minute hop and some cases even the 20-minute hop. I now, I do all my additions like uh, 10 minutes would be kind of the, the earliest one after the bittering. Uh, but a lot of them I'm doing at like five minutes and one minute and just tons of them. And you get this kind of new West Coast pale ale flavor that way, the, the Firestone Walkers and the, um, you know, those that are just so hop forward, but not bitter. It's such a clean uh, flavor with a, with a lot of flavor a, instead of a lot yeah, of I bitter. Yeah, I think that's, that's because a lot of those hop oils are really uh, fragile. And yeah. they tend to boil off very quickly. A lot of and those I, aromatic oils. 
Right. And I'll tell you, too, that I'm the king of making beers too bitter. I, not because I like them, but with those 30 minute additions and I don't know, I throw a bunch of hops in there because I think it smells good. And before I know it, it's not balanced and it's bitter. But with the late additions, I've I've been less apt to produce two bitter beers. You know, they're a little more balanced. Uh, I don't know. Those are probably my best tips, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Sure. Well, Justin, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I'd just like to say that it's, it's been a lot of fun watching the industry grow in the seven years that I have been doing this. And I, I didn't, I knew that we'd do well. I was pretty confident when we started, but it's blown my mind how many people are listening and going professional, um, you know, just taking that leap and going for it. We know a lot of listeners that have done that. And so I just want people to, you know, keep it up. This passion for home brewing is amazing and it's pushing the craft beer world. It's getting peop- a lot of people out of their jobs that they didn't like, and they're, they're taking the leap and, and doing now jobs they do like. I mean, I've seen homebrew shops open uh, since the show that took the leap. And, and like I said, brewers who go work for another brewery, brewers who open their own brew pub, all this kind of stuff. And I just say keep it up, and, and I think I'm kind of proof of I started with nothing. We had a credit card in a garage, and that's how we started the BN. And uh, <laughs> don't be afraid to just give it a shot because it's, it's worked pretty well for us. And, but you know, you're... Brad, I, you're doing you this know, full time now, right, Justin? I'm doing it full time. And I know, you know, when I met you, Brad, you were just taking the leap too. You, you I'm worked full time as well. Yeah. And a boy, you, you know, a side project for a long time. You got to, you got to pay the dues. And Jamil, Jamil opened his, uh, his brewery here recently. Yeah. So many of these guys just going for it. And I love to see it. It's, it's very fun to watch. And I'm just saying, you know, uh, if you can do it and you want to do it, keep at it. It's fun to watch. Well, thank you again for being on the show. I really appreciate you being here. No problem. Thanks for having me, Brad. Anytime, man. So again, that was uh, Justin Crossley. He's, uh, he's the operator of the Brewing Network at thebrewingnetwork.com. Well, I'd like to thank Justin Crossley for coming on this week's episode from the Brewing Network at thebrewingnetwork.com. I'd like to thank you for listening. I really appreciate your continued support of the podcast. If you have any feedback, you can go to beersmith.com slash form or beersmith.com slash blog. Look up this episode and leave your feedback there. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week.